young woman starring in her own home movie cavorts on the shores of an alpine lake. Eva Braun, Adolf Hitler's girlfriend. He was 23 years older. She was a strictly kept state secret. Their relationship could never be made public. German women adored Hitler. They projected all their fantasies onto him. Now that might not have worked so well if Hitler was known to have a girlfriend or a mistress or a wife and a family. It was very important for Goebbels' propaganda machine that Hitler remain celibate. Eva Braun's home movies showed Hitler to be something very different from the propaganda portrait of the celibate, lonely leader. I think that was part of his image, a carefully calculated image. The idea that he was married to Germany, that Germany was sort of in his soul and there could be no distractions. Eva Braun's films were never meant to be seen outside the Berghof. Hitler's alpine retreat above the Bavarian picture postcard town of Berchtesgarten. In the public eye, she didn't exist. It was only after they married and killed themselves in the Berlin bunker that Eva Braun became infamous. She was one of the many young women who attempted suicide after falling under Hitler's spell. Maria Reiter was 16. Her brother-in-law only just saved her from suicide when Hitler spurned her. Geli Raubel was Hitler's niece. She was only 23 when she killed herself in Hitler's apartment. Unity Mitford was the English aristocrat infatuated with Hitler, who shot herself when she was 25. According to Hitler, there is nothing better than to train such a young thing, a girl, as pliable as wax. You do see footage of women kind of wailing and gnashing, you know, with, with passion for him. And of course, some of that is the uh, outpouring of Goebbels' propaganda machine. But I think we can be pretty certain, I mean, certainly from diaries and letters, that, that many women, certainly younger women, had basically a crush on Hitler. It wasn't just young, pliable girls but also mature, high-status women like Winifred Wagner, who were enthralled by his charms and political might. The wealthy industrialist divorcee Magda Goebbels was also attracted to Hitler. She had to make do with his propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels. As his wife, she was the first lady of the Nazi regime. She was but one of a host of women who fell under Hitler's often fatal attractions. But as a young man in his Austrian hometown of Linz, it seems that Adolf Hitler was shy and impotent among women. The people who knew him at the time, I think there was a guy called August Kubisek, who wrote his memoirs, describes Hitler as very sort of awkward in the company of girls. He didn't have a girlfriend at all in his early life. There's no mention of any girl. Until he spotted Stephanie, a high-ranking government official's daughter he didn't dare approach that Hitler had this kind of fantasy woman. She was blonde, she was tall, she was unattainable. He saw her across a park. Apparently, he wrote poetry to her. He also wrote her a love letter, but he never signed it. Stephanie caught the eye of many admirers, but Hitler could only watch as she strolled down the main street with her mother. He kept his adoration to himself until much later, when the official's daughter received a mysterious letter. I did get an anonymous letter in which he told me he was about to go to the Academy of Arts in Vienna, but then he would return to Linz and marry me. Hitler never made it into the Academy of Arts in Vienna. Stephanie married someone else. An infamous course of history resumed its fateful path. In August 1914, a kind of war euphoria engulfed a generation of young German men and a 25-year-old Austrian volunteer, Adolf Hitler. He joined an infantry reserve regiment and was sent to the Western Front. His unit suffered devastating losses. As a messenger, Corporal Hitler was spared the horrors of trench combat, but he was awarded the Iron Cross Medal for bravery, something he would later display on his dictator's jacket. His regiment's diary still exists in the Bavarian State Archive. It says that Hitler was stationed in the small northern French town of Fulm in the spring of 1916. Decades later, a French woman claimed she met him in that same town. A 
collector in Belgium owns a painting, an alleged portrait of Charlotte Lobjoie. The portrait shows a farm girl with a generous cleavage, clutching a pitchfork. It's signed Adolf Hitler, 1916, but no one has proved Hitler actually painted it. Charlotte fell pregnant in June 1917 in the town of Montigny. According to Hitler's regimental war diary, he was also in Montigny around the same time. Charlotte's son, Jean-Marie, was born on the 25th of March, 1918. He was convinced that he was Adolf Hitler's son. I asked the man in French, who was your father? He replied, Adolf Hitler was my father. Monsieur Loret, qui était votre père? Mon père est Adolf Hitler. But there was no evidence to prove his remarkable claim. Jean-Marie desperately tried to find that evidence, employing experts to compare eyes, handwriting and blood types, but the results were inconclusive. He died in 1985, unable to prove what he firmly believed, that he was Adolf Hitler's son. Perhaps the most damning evidence against Jean-Marie's claim comes from Hitler's former comrades. They suggested Corporal Hitler just wasn't interested in sex with foreign girls. All of his comrades say that he was a rather sober, boring guy. I mean, he was only 26 years of age, but they called him Uncle Dolph. And he carried around with him this little pet dog. And when they would say to, say to him things like, we're going off to a brothel, he'd say, no, don't, don't, uh, you know, sully your blood. And he was going on and on. He was quite against the idea. Without a definitive DNA sample from Jean-Marie's grave, the mystery over Hitler's alleged offspring remains unsolved. After his service in the First World War, Hitler re-emerged to fight another battle. He promised to restore pride and prosperity amid the economic and social turmoil that followed Germany's humiliating defeat. His fiery speeches, full of nationalistic, anti-Semitic rhetoric, struck a chord with many Germans. The local rabble-rouser was eventually elevated to the national political stage. He was a regular visitor to the idyllic Bavarian spa town of Berchtesgarten. During an alpine stroll in September 1926, he met 16-year-old Maria, or Mitzi Reiter. Hitler was enraptured, she was underwhelmed. Speaking for the first time, her nephew describes how she compared his trademark moustache to a fat black fly. She told my mother right from the beginning, I can't stand this man with his silly fly under his nose, and he's 20 years older than me. My mother also told her, he's much too old for you. But Mitzi soon changed her tune when Hitler invited her to see him in action at a Nazi party meeting. His performance before an ecstatic crowd had the desired effect. When she entered the hall, Hitler interrupted his speech, walked up to her, kissed both Mitzi's and Annie's hands, led them to the table, returned to the podium and continued his speech. She was 16 years old. There aren't any 16-year-old girls who are this publicly in front of all these people, admired by the man standing up there, and this probably really impressed her. That's when my thin ice completely melted, Maria said later. Hitler invited her on excursions. During an outing into the Berchtesgarten countryside, there was a first kiss. But the romance didn't blossom. Politics took up much of Hitler's time. He sent love letters. My dear child, how delighted I am when my dear love writes to me. You have no idea how happy a letter makes me that lets your dear voice speak to me. Child, you really don't know what you are to me and how much I love you. Yours, Wolf. I think in the context of the time, I think, you know, older men went out with much younger women. 
And Hitler's father, remember, married a woman who was 23 years younger than him. He was 47 and she was, I think, 24. Um, so it, it wasn't unusual in the Hitler family to go after somebody who was younger. And remember, Reiter was 16, Ava Braun, when he met her, was only 17. So in fact, Hitler seemed to like these very young, childlike women. Despite a penchant for childlike women, Hitler's busy political campaigning across Germany meant he had less and less time to devote to dear children like Maria Reiter. After waiting many months to see her beloved Wolf, Mitzi became desperate, distraught, and suicidal. Mitzi tried to kill herself, and thank God they found her at the last moment. In an interview in 1959, she claimed that Hitler turned away from her to avoid a scandal. She said that an anonymous letter was sent to the Nazi party, threatening to report Hitler to the police for the seduction of a minor. He claims, actually, she had sex with Hitler. But whether this is true, of course, we, we can never know. If Maria Reiter did have sex with Hitler, it seems to have come at a severe price. My mother was horrified when she found out that Mitzi, who always wanted to have children, had herself sterilized on Hitler's instruction, because Hitler didn't want to have any descendants, and she wanted to stay with Hitler on all accounts, and so she did it, and she couldn't have any kids. She probably hoped that Hitler would marry her after all. But marriage was out of the question for the aspiring Führer. My bride is Germany, he declared. Back in 1925, he had already made a dramatic proclamation in the Nazi party newspaper. It read, I am so married to politics that I can't consider also getting engaged. Despite such propaganda and efforts to play the child-friendly bachelor, Hitler also attracted older, respected women of Bavarian high society. Hitler also attracted interest from some of the grand dames of the Third Reich. These women were drawn to Hitler because he was charismatic and because he did seem to have the interests of the German people at heart. These women were dyed in the wool nationalists. Winifred Wagner was a British-born German nationalist. She was married to Richard Wagner's son, Siegfried. After he passed away, Hitler proposed marriage, a calculated move that would give him prestige and perhaps satisfy a personal obsession. He loved Wagner, Richard Wagner's music. I mean, everybody knows that while he was in Vienna, he went to the opera nearly every night. In fact, he spent all of his inheritance going to the opera. So obviously, when Winifred Wagner came into his circle, obviously there was a bit of fan worship the other way. In a sense, it was like sort of, if he could meld Hitler with Wagner, I mean, just think of that as an idea for Germany. That's it, so I'm in fact, zwischen 30. He asked her twice between 1930 and 33 if she would marry him, and both times she answered that she could only do that if he was in an official position. Once Hitler reached the official position of Chancellor, he didn't need to marry for prestige. In the only on-camera interview she ever agreed to, Winifred Wagner described Hitler's charm. I have to admit, that he immediately made a deep and powerful impression on me. Especially his eyes were incredibly attractive. Completely blue and very big and expressive. It wasn't just big blue expressive eyes that appealed to supporters like Winifred Wagner. In the case of Winifred Wagner, they hated Jews. Hitler's anti-Semitism Hitler's German nationalism, Hitler's anti-Bolshevism appealed to them. It appealed to their ideas. So it wasn't simply a matter of his charisma or his sex appeal. These were smart political women who had operated in the um, political world of the Nazi elite. It was this Nazi elite that made symbolic pilgrimages to Wagner's grave and the festival hall in his traditional Bavarian home of Bayreuth a place that came to represent the Nazi ideals of superior German culture and a superior German master race. Elsa Bruckmann, 
a Munich aristocrat and publisher's wife, also sponsored Hitler, introducing him to influential industrialists and bankers. She and other respectable women not only gave Hitler money, but perhaps something more valuable that money couldn't buy. Respectability. Is that they were part of the upper bourgeoisie. These were respectable women. They ran um, uh, salons at which artists, political figures, writers, journalists would gather. They could introduce Hitler to influential people, and by appearing in their homes, Hitler appeared to be a respectable figure. They helped to sanitize, to domesticate Hitler. Of course, they didn't change his ideas one bit. But Hitler's most important benefactress is Helena Bechstein. She supported him financially, as she admitted during a police interview in 1924, by way of giving him art objects. These were of high value. The famous piano manufacturer's wife also supported Hitler's election campaign with credits and a brand new Mercedes compressor for his journeys across Germany. Hitler's drive to the top was accelerated by women like Frau Bechstein. She was kind of a woman about town in Munich, so she had the dinner parties that Hitler attended. She, she started to become very attracted to him. She was much older than Hitler, and Hitler had a kind of persona, very charming, um, very gallant towards older women, and older women liked him. This happened all the way through his career. But these were calculated social climbing relationships. Privately, Hitler preferred the company of younger women including his own niece, Gailey Raubel, the daughter of his half-sister, Angela. Hitler became Gailey's guardian. She was very young, she was very impressionable, she had lost her father when she was young, and she saw Hitler, who was her half-uncle, uh, in many ways as a father figure. When she turned 19, she went to live with him in Munich. She took a room in his spacious apartment. Hitler was proud of his outgoing niece and took her to meetings with Nazi party friends and colleagues. Contemporaries described Gailey as a sweet girl who was always the center of attention. She was outgoing, she was bubbly, she wasn't particularly attractive. She didn't fit the kind of area model, the blonde model, but he seemed to really like her. But Uncle Adolf's bubbly niece had other admirers. Hitler's chauffeur and longtime Nazi party comrade, Emil Maurice. In January 1928, she sent birthday wishes signed, Many Kisses, Your Gailey. Well, he'd nominated his chauffeur, Emil Maurice, to be her chaperone. And he was horrified when he thought they were having romantic liaisons. And he sacked him because of that. So really, you can see how possessive he was of Gailey, even towards her private life. Marriage plans between Gailey and Hitler's driver were dashed. Perhaps Uncle Adolf was jealous of her affair. Perhaps he was more than an uncle to his bubbly niece. The exact nature of the relationship remains a mystery. Certainly, the relationship was very, very close, very intense, much too intense, a relationship between an uncle and his niece. Regardless of Hitler's possible jealousy, the relationship between his niece and Emil Maurice was doomed. Years later, it emerged that the Nazi party veteran, the man who joined the elite SS bodyguard at the very beginning, had a family secret. Hitler, had an dossier. Hitler pulled out a file which detailed Emile Maurice's life story and also his family background. It concluded that Emile Maurice had Jewish ancestors. Hitler's party colleague had Jewish roots. Hitler, whose backbone in the party was anti-Semitism and who constantly gave anti-Jewish speeches, of course couldn't tolerate his niece marrying a Jew. Von 
Whether Hitler already knew about his chauffeur's Jewish ancestry or not, the affair was over. He spoiled his niece with expensive clothes, visits to the opera, and dinners at exclusive restaurants. It was a life of luxury, but not of freedom. She complained that she couldn't do anything without Uncle Alf's permission. Hitler was constantly on tour for his election campaign. But shocking news came from Munich on the 19th of September, 1931. Gailey was found dead in his apartment. Now, of course, this could be an absolutely enormous scandal for Hitler. And it's, it's hushed up, he's very sad, he goes into depression. And I think clearly the impact uh, on having a dead half-niece found in the flat uh, could be immense. But I think we can see the efficacy of the Nazi regime that so much of this is just simply brushed away. The original police report still survives in the state archives of Munich. It concluded that Gailey's death was suicide. That she got Hitler's gun from a drawer around 3 p.m. The report says a member of staff saw Gailey go into her room and lock the door behind her. Gailey put the gun directly against her skin. bullet missed her heart, hit the lung, and killed her. Her body lay undiscovered for 17 hours until the next day, when housekeeper Annie Winter knocked on Gailey's door and raised the alarm. There is still much speculation over the apparent suicide. Did Hitler play any part in her death? I think that the pressure that he was putting on her, the possessiveness towards her, there's no question that that was a factor in her suicide. And she even said that in certain letters. You know, the only way I can make a dent in Uncle Adolf is to do something outrageous. So she had threatened suicide before. Gailey's mother and several others in Hitler's circle didn't believe the verdict of suicide. Could it have been an accident? The original police report was subject to special examination by Munich police investigator Thomas Althaus. For the Munich police investigator, the evidence pointed to suicide, not an accidental gunshot. In order to fire a shot, you first have to release the safety catch. And this Walther gun has a safety catch near its rear. You then have to release the catch in order to pull the trigger. For me, an accident is out of the question based on the facts presented in the report. Gailey was buried in Vienna. Hitler said that her death affected him deeply. Hitler also had other women on his mind. In the months after Gailey's death, he met the wealthy ex-wife of an influential industrialist. Magda Krunt lived with her son in a luxurious apartment in Berlin. She was also a lover to Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's virulently anti-Semitic propaganda chief and Gauleiter, or regional Nazi ruler, of Berlin. He was short and crippled with a club foot, but his power and proximity to Hitler made him attractive to the wealthy divorcee. But it seems she was also attracted to his boss. And when Goebbels introduced her to Hitler, the feeling was mutual. The propaganda chief made a note about his Führer's apparent affections for Magda in August 1931. Magda is a little too friendly towards the boss. I suffer from it. She isn't being a lady, haven't slept a wink. I'm afraid I can't be sure of her faithfulness. I think Magda Goebbels was attracted to Hitler. There's no doubt about that. And I think Hitler was also attracted to her. So in a sense, Magda and Adolf could have become a couple. There's no doubt about that in that period. The relationship between them did not develop beyond an initial attraction and a lasting friendship. She had already agreed to marry his propaganda chief. Goebbels wrote in his diary, the boss called me. 
invited himself to dinner. Rascal. But any kind of affair between Hitler and his bride-to-be was not on the menu. At the time, Hitler then saw that Goebbels liked her, he encouraged them to get together, and even acted as a witness at the wedding, so it doesn't seem as though he was still harboring some kind of infatuation towards her. They married in December 1931. Magda Goebbels became the first lady of the Nazi Reich. She was paraded at state visits and relished her performances as the trophy wife and mother. She had six children with her husband, epitomizing the Nazi ideal of a dutiful, fertile mother. I think Magda Goebbels was somebody he really admired. I mean, she was the kind of Aryan supermother in a way. Remember, she had six children. Uh, she was a, a rich woman. She was a charming woman. When he was in Berlin, she held all of Hitler's dinner parties, became the host of his dinner parties. So he saw her as a kind of an iconic figure for National Socialism. Her husband's propaganda machine ensured that Hitler's all-powerful image attracted legions of female fans across Germany. Such stage-managed adulation also attracted admirers from across the English Channel. There was a group in Britain in the 1930s amongst the aristocracy who were infatuated by Hitler. And they talked about, you know, what a great leader Adolf Hitler was, how he made the trains run on time. And weren't these concentration camps quite good in getting work shy people back to work and so on? So there was a great admiration for Hitler amongst the upper classes. One of the most infamous British upper class supporters was Unity Mitford, a distant relative to Winston Churchill. She and her sisters were idolized English socialites. Their father, David Freeman Mitford, inherited the title Lord Reedsdale. Raised on an English country estate, the Mitfords interacted with influential writers, poets, and politicians. Unity and her sister Diana were devoted fascists. Her elder sister, Diana, had fallen in love with Oswald Mosley, the English fascist Führer. And she was younger than Diana by several years, and very impressed. And she wanted to show her sister she could get a bigger, better Führer. Unity Mitford became a kind of stalker and followed Hitler around Munich in 1934. She discovered a little restaurant where he used to lunch. Uh, called the Osteria Bavaria, and she used to go there every day, hoping he would come in. Her plan worked, and she soon met her beloved Führer in person. One day, he sent Herr Deutelmoser, the owner of the restaurant, to say, would you like to come to our table for coffee? Of course, she was overjoyed, and from that moment, they became tremendous friends. He called her the perfect example of Aryan womanhood. She was also anti-Semitic as well, strongly anti-Semitic, and she hung out with Julius Streicher. He was the uh, editor of a violently anti-Semitic newspaper called Der Stürmer, and she even liked him. So there were many things that she had in common with Hitler, all of them quite evil and odious in a way. And really, you know, a, a page in the history of Britain is quite a shameful one, really. Unity Mitford became a kind of Nazi party groupie. She was invited to official events and even had her Nazi party badge personally presented to her by Hitler. They met hundreds of times over the following years. Hitler seemed to, to think that Unity represented more than she did, that it was something that would lead in English circles to, to sympathy and understanding, which of course was, was completely false. But I think he also thought that um, she, she looked very Aryan, that she, was, she looked like um, girls were supposed to look, a big, tall, strong and blonde. Like a Valkyrie, which happened to be her second name. She became a part of Hitler's entourage. Her enthusiasm earned her a nickname, Mitfahrt, or ride along in German. But the Gestapo initially mistrusted the over-enthusiastic Englischer. Files in the Munich State Archives show how the foreigner was followed around the clock. Eventually, it seems she was cleared of suspicion. 
her public anti-Semitic rants and declarations in Germany would also prove her Nazi credentials. During a party gathering near Nuremberg in 1935, Unity Mitford delivered a passionate anti-Semitic speech. She thought that um, Nazism was the answer to everything. She's representative, I think, of a lot of people who thought that Hitler um, was opening up uh, possibilities of a better Nazi world. And um, there would be victims, of course, but they would all be poor people and miserable Jews and unhappy people who deserve to be victims. And the world would be cleaner and better as a result of it. The Nazi smear sheet, Der Stürmer, published an open letter by Unity. The general English populace has no idea of the Jewish danger. Our worst Jews only operate behind the scenes. We look forward to the day when we can say with force and authority, England for the English, Jews get out. She soon put her words into cruel action. Hitler saw to it that Unity Mitford could take her pick from a range of properties seized from Jewish owners forced to flee their homes. Agnes Strasse, 26, took her fancy. She moved in as the Jewish owners were being thrown out. The Jewish couple who were living there was, were, were actually in the, in the apartment. And Unity went around saying, I'll have these curtains and uh, I'll have the sofa here and this is very ugly. We'll have to change all this and we'll have to modernize this and so on. And um, the Jewish owners of this were, were standing in front of her and weeping um, because they knew that this was the end for them. In the summer of 1939, Unity learned that war was imminent. Hitler invaded Poland on the 1st of September. Two days later, Great Britain declared war on Germany. She did care so passionately about, she cared passionately about the war, she cared passionately enough about England, that when Germany and England went to war, she couldn't bear it. So she shot herself, which is a sort of, it's, the, it's an operatic story. I mean, it might have been written by Wagner or Verdi. But there was nothing heroic or operatic about the outcome. She shot herself in the head. I mean, no, that's not theatrical. It looks like it was serious, but she didn't actually kill herself. She was taken to Switzerland at Hitler's expense and then repatriated to Britain, where she stayed in hospital. She lived out the next sort of seven or eight years of her life, you know, in a rather dreadful condition. With a bullet still lodged in her skull, the incapacitated traitors returned to Britain sparked a new sensation. When our cameramen went to meet the cross-channel steamer, they found extraordinary precautions being taken. It was the occasion of the arrival from Germany of the daughter of Lord Reedsdale, Unity Mitford, friend of Hitler. Long after her miserable death, speculation lingered as to whether Unity Mitford shared more than just an extreme hatred for Jews with Adolf Hitler. Unity um, was completely besotted with the idea of Hitler and the person of Hitler. It's a kind of love, really, but it's not a, it's not a physical relationship. The nearest that that came to anything physical was she would sit at Hitler's feet and he would stroke her hair and say, mein armes Kind and mein liebes Kind and things of that sort. Over one in any conceivable way, a sexual relationship, of course, because I, well, I mean, I say of course, uh, but uh, I think it was just it on 
in, in form, it was the like sort of groupy girl with a pop star, but the, the pop star ch- ch- chose her as one of his girls. I mean, she was one of his favorite girls. Another of Hitler's favorite girls was possibly pleased to see the back of the British devotee he called my darling child. Eva Braun was a laboratory assistant for Hitler's personal photographer Heinrich Hoffmann. A secret relationship developed, and just months after Gailey Rabel's death in the winter of 1931, Eva became Hitler's girlfriend. She was 20, he was 43. The fact that these women were always very young and that they were always in a very dependent relationship with him underlines that he didn't just crave for power in politics, but that he also looked for such power in his relationships with women. Like Gailey Raubel and Unity Mitford, Eva Braun would also fall under Hitler's deadly spell. She wrote of her Führer's apparent affections for unity in 1935. As Frau Hoffmann told me, he now has a replacement for me. It is called Valkyrie and looks the part, including the legs. But those are the dimensions he likes. Eva Braun had already tried to kill herself once. When she didn't hear from Hitler for a couple of months, she wrote in her diary that her second suicide attempt would be successful. She took 35 sleeping pills, survived, and by doing so, succeeded in cementing her place at the Führer's side. Ava Brown was not simply a dumb blonde. Ava Brown was actually a very shrewd um, young woman. And most importantly, she fitted the bill for the perfect Aryan uh, woman. And she, uh, I think, played up to that role. Um, She knew where she fitted in Hitler's ideology, in Nazi ideology. Three months after another failed attempt at suicide, Hitler installed Eva Braun at his Alpine Berghof retreat as his secret girlfriend. She was virtually invisible to the public. Nobody knew that she was his lover or his mistress. She had a guest house, guest room, rather, in the Berghof. And she was sort of passed off as a secretary in his private circle. Everyone in Hitler's entourage knew that Ava Brown was his mistress. And at the end of a long, hard day, they would disappear off to the sleeping quarters together. But for the public image of a celibate Führer dedicated to Germany alone, she did not exist. We know from the kind of letters sent to him that, that German women were kind of madly in love with him, that they, they cared deeply about the Führer. Now that dynamic could not have worked if Hitler was known to have a, a mistress, uh, let alone a wife. Um, and that is why uh, Ava Brown was kept in the shadows. From the shadows, she unwittingly compiled a remarkable archive, the only detailed visual record of Hitler's domestic and business life at the Berghof. Four hours of her home movies survived, spanning the years from 1938 to 1944. She was now seen at that time, 1938, to be Hitler's muse, his girlfriend. And so really, he let her do things like that. She kept a diary. She kept film, but of course it was only for her private consumption. None of this was to be released to the public, remember. So this was strictly private footage, which he allowed her to do. He treated her rather like a kind of errant daughter who was in his house, who could go around taking photographs, having a laugh. In August 1939, Eva Brown seems to have unwittingly captured a pivotal moment in world history. Hitler looks tense. By forging a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, he thought he had free reign to invade Poland. At this moment, it seems a message plunged his war plans into uncertainty. But the film is mute. What was Hitler saying? An experienced team of hearing-impaired lip-readers were able to decipher what the Nazi dictator was saying. Hitler's lost words were heard again for the first time since that fateful day in August 1939. Das ist mir schon bekannt. 
Da pfeife ich drauf. Du weißt ja sicher von dem Telegramm. Ich würde es am liebsten vernichten. Hast du die Herren zusammengerufen? Dieses Telegramm hat Folgen für uns und wird auf jeden Fall zu einer Katastrophe führen. Was wollen Sie? The new translation suggests that Hitler was reacting to a telegram from the British government. Perhaps the one in which Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain reiterated his support for Poland. It would mean that Hitler could not simply march in unchallenged. This could be the catastrophe the Nazi dictator was referring to. He never believed Chamberlain would stand by his guarantee to Poland. So when he heard that Chamberlain was going to stand by the guarantee, he was quite shocked because this meant now war. The dictator wavered and his pliable girl, Eva Brown, had caught the moment on her film camera. Eva Brown films this scene, this tense moment. The first news arrives, the reaction of the world, and it isn't going as Hitler and his helpers had planned it. She witnessed the start and end of the war when Hitler's dream of a thousand-year Reich ended in the Berlin bunker, far from the Alpine vistas that surrounded her golden years at the Berghof. Ava Brown wasn't simply um, some um, ditzy young woman. She actually had a very specific role to play. She played her part of the secret lover. But as the war continued, she saw less of the Führer as he spent more time away from the Berghof, trying to fight what became a losing battle on two fronts. Hitler had promised a brighter future, victory, and a palace in Linz where they would live happily ever after. They did eventually get married, but that's where the fairy tale ended. Their marriage lasted one day. They killed themselves as the Red Army advanced towards their bunker in Berlin. And Eva Braun would not be the last of Hitler's women to commit suicide. Magda Goebbels and her husband Joseph chose to follow their Führer in life and death. I think she was determined to stick with Hitler in the bunker right to the bitter end. And she sent a letter to one of her relatives right towards the end saying, I can't live in a Germany that is not ruled by Adolf Hitler. And therefore, if the Führer dies, I will die with him. And so will my children. Magda and Joseph poisoned their six children before killing themselves a day after Hitler committed suicide. Unity Mitford died in 1948 as a result of meningitis, a consequence of her attempt to shoot herself in the head. Maria Mitzi Reiter, saved by a relative when she tried to hang herself, after Hitler spurned her in 1927, sold her story to Stern magazine in 1959. She wanted Hitler to continue to be idolized. She was a completely devoted national socialist. And she didn't change to her dying day. Winifred Wagner, widower to the composer's son, remained a fanatical National Socialist long after the war and the horrific extent of Nazi atrocities had come to light. Adolf. <laughs> There was also a phrase in Nazi Germany, which many of these people believed, which was, if only the Führer knew. So they could carry around this idea that maybe he didn't know all of these evil things that were going on. And we see people now who are actually Holocaust deniers and so on, who sort of carry on this kind of myth. Deluded or diehard Nazi disciples, Hitler's women adored their Führer in vain. Like his greater German Reich, their love was doomed to fail.